All right, welcome back to take two on the night of Go Horns of Fight Songs. Uh, we were about halfway through the schedule before we realized we were not having audio from a specific human being who does not have audio at the moment, so he can't say anything to me right now until I put his little voice box hole back on here. So we're just going to do this real quick. But hey, you know, we're uh, this is what happens when people who don't know what they're doing try to do things. Okay, you're good. We're good. We're good. We're going to start back over. So if you were here for the first half of the episode, my bad. You're going to have to hear some stuff over again. If you weren't here for the first half of the episode and you're stumbling in now, well, hey, we're back at the beginning, so awesome sauce. Also, the people on YouTube will have no idea that any of this happened other than me saying this right now, so they only have to stick through this once. Hooray them. And they don't have to listen to my voice for that long, for an, for an hour and a half. No, nope, just me. All right, well, we are... Going to just jump right back into this with the North Dakota schedule. We're not going to do any other preamble that we did before. We missed it. It's gone forever. Don't care. Um, there's not even proof of it on this channel anymore because I already deleted the video because I'm not editing shit. Uh, UND opens the season with an exhibition game against Canadian opponent Manitoba. Uh, we're seeing some of the Canadian schools come back for exhibition games now that the border has opened and COVID protocols have lightened. Um, good, easy, nice, relaxing start to the season. Not a lot of pressure for guys coming back, getting knocking the rust off. Um, you know, North Dakota was one of those teams that did have a few guys play in the World Juniors that were rescheduled. So, should be a positive start for them to have kind of a stress-free situation to start and they can just play some hockey. Yeah, good good coaches evaluation. And then uh, they kind of roll right into uh, same type of thing with Holy Cross, a team that did not have a strong record last year. Uh, ben, I think you said 2000. 2006 was the last two te yeah. times these teams met. So, you know, 16 years, um, no players around the area that, that would know each other. Um, hell, that's back before I started following hockey at the college level. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a nice trans trans nice uh, slow ramp up to the start of the season and before NCHC play. Uh, a team that I just, I know nothing of Holy Cross. I think they're an East Coast team. Mm -hmm. uh, I think ECAC, maybe Atlantic Hockey. Actually, I think they're Atlantic Hockey. North Dakota is 4-0 all time against them. Um, and, and have played them in the NCAA tournament a couple times. So there is some history to these two schools, but it's it's old history. Um, but, but like I said, a good start to the season. We're, we're knocking the rust off. It's probably going to, you know, really the first real test might be Quinnipiac in the third week of the season, the second actual week for North Dakota as far as um, regular season games go, not exhibition games. Quinnipiac has a really solid record. They did not play very well in the NCAA tournament. Um, the two teams actually met for the national title in 2016, which UND won by a score of 5-1. to one. Um that seems to be a recurring theme with NCHC schools winning national titles by a score of five to one. Oddly enough. And then after Quinnipiac, which I think we both could see a potential split, they come with probably their fiercest rival on the road at University of Minnesota, Golden Gophers, who were a Frozen Four team last year. Uh, could be buying to repeat it with Bob Motzko as the coach uh, and having a couple NHL draft picks, top NHL draft picks coming back uh, at Mariucci Arena. That's probably going to be their toughest one of the non-conference schedule. Yeah, and as we said, I mean, it's kind of hard to pit the Big Ten against the NCHC. The Big Ten is really more of a name recognition league or conference league, whatever you want to call it. I've heard it both ways. Um, with a couple schools really only getting kind of one-and-done players, kind of like Kentucky does for NCAA basketball. Um, it, it, it could be a good tilt, though, honestly. It, it, the thing that leads, that kind of leads for Minnesota is it, it, they have the home ice here. 
we know how hard it is to play it at the Ralph. Um, I think it's I think it's good to to kind of build up their non schedule the way they did, even though it's not necessarily the toughest of opponents. Their opponent does get tougher each week. It does, and there there is that rivalry. Like I said, it's the probably the most heated rivalry that they have for teams in Minnesota. And Minnesota does have a couple kids coming back that could have signed pro contracts. I know uh, one guy, I don't know why I can't remember his name right now, but he was traded for by the Wild. He's a defenseman, and he decided that he was going to come back to Minnesota instead of signing a pro contract. So... They have a couple of three, four year players that are top tier players that have come back and want to play for this program and win a national championship for the true U of M. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they're they're a better U of M at the moment. Uh, <laughs> I dislike the one here a little bit more than them. Uh, however, they have I have issues with your U of M as well, mostly the football team. Anyway, uh, they will be representing the NCHC for the second straight year in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame game this year played at the fantastic T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, It's their second year, straight year in this game. They did lose to Penn State last year in Nashville. And it's also the first time that Arizona State and North Dakota have played each other. And it's, it's a phenomenal arena. I've been to an NHL game there the first year that it was open it was great Arizona State they're like Omaha where they're you you never know what you're going to get I think North Dakota wins this game but it's kind of fun especially when you're going to get Arizona State fans however many they have we still don't quite know and then the North Dakota fans going out to Vegas uh, because, let's be honest, it's Vegas. People are going to go vacation out there and and gamble their money and uh, and uh, put money on the game if they can. And if we were out there, probably putting the money on North Dakota for this one. And speaking of Omaha, that's the next series at Omaha with a team that we they can run hot and cold even in the same weekend. Yeah, I mean, but the, they do play North Dakota pretty well. I mean, North Dakota does lead the all-time series between these two teams, which does have a bunch of games played in it, going back to the WCHA. Uh, but they split their four games last se- season. Um, it was a big point in, in how Denver was able to sneak in a, a piece of the Penrose last year. Uh, Omaha earning that sweep against North Dakota while Denver swept Colorado College. Uh, two teams that you know it can go either way Omaha is building I think they may actually have lost another player I saw reports that their their leading goal scorer coming into the season had not registered for fall classes so he may which I believe their semester starts this week or started this week or is starts next week it's somewhere in the next couple of weeks and, and he wasn't registered for classes so they're Kind of not expecting him back at this point, I guess. I'm not entirely sure where that sits. So there may be some more in the works for Omaha. They might actually struggle a little bit more than I was expecting to them or them to this year. But they do have the goalie from Slovakia, right? Is mm-hmm. that where he was from? Who just played in the World yes. Juniors coming in. Um, I think he's kind of the front runner to be the goaltender there. And step in for Isaiah Seville, who left for the pro ranks after last season. Um, and then they, they get to come back home to Grand Forks to to decide that Penrose Cup from last year in uh, when Denver comes to town. And I think this could be uh, a pretty close series and think we both agreed this is probably going to be the most entertaining series of the weekend with 
the two teams that split for the Penrose Cup last year, the thing that helps North Dakota is it's in Grand Forks, and they finally really get uh, – yeah, the the fans are going to be up for Holy Cross and Quinnipiac, but as soon as the conference play comes – Denver, especially coming as their first home series, the fans are going to be up for that one. Yeah, and North Dakota did sweep in Grand Forks last season, so they're definitely capable of winning the series. Uh, I think it's going to come down to goalie play, and I, I think Denver has the stronger goalie. But as far as outside of that, they're they're pretty even as far as what they can do score wise. Um, but it should be a pretty pretty good heavyweight fight. Uh, I think I think it's there's going to be goals scored for both teams. I don't think we're going to see like a one zero or a two one goalie game. But it it will still come down to which goalie can make the right save at the right time and, and put their team on top. I don't really see it being a sweep again for North Dakota, but I lean split. It, it's going to be a good series for both teams. Um... Both teams they take advantage of the strengths of the other team, so I don't think it's going to be like we kind of predicted in some of the other series in the NCHC with the other schedules for low scoring games. I don't think this is, these are going to be low scoring games. I think they your mic's messing up. Really? I don't know if you're hitting like a chord or something, but you're like you get quiet and then come back. I don't know. I don't know if you got loose cable or if you're not, no, not using maybe. like you think you are. I don't know. But, yeah, we missed some of that. So, Well, I, I just think it's going to be a high-scoring series. Um, they both take advantage of mistakes. Uh, and, and I don't think that, like, most of the series that we predicted. Hang on, hang on. You're, you're gone again. I don't know if your hand's on something that it shouldn't be or if you got a loose cable. Or you're just not projecting with your whole voice, but there is something going on here. Uh, I'm projecting with my whole voice. I don't. You're you're good for this moment, but it's it's something. Do, do I do I need to just like? You might have to just hold, hold that there. I don't know. God, this damn episode it. has been a struggle bus, but whatever, whatever. <laughs> We're gonna keep rolling through this on bitch. I'm not doing this again. Uh. Anyway, yeah, high scoring games. Close games. Each team is going to take advantage of mistakes. I need you to buy. I need you to buy a real mic. Um, I have a real mic. You shut the hell up. Next se- next series is against Miami. Miami is a team that has been on the struggle um, for the last couple seasons. Really, kind of since they got rid of Rico Blasi, who's currently the coach at uh, was it St. Thomas, the that the newest program that just. Hit the the division one scene last year. Yeah, yeah, I believe yep. I believe he's there. Uh, he was a longtime Miami coach. They they they've kind of struggled, which led to him being let go, and, and really since he's left. Um, but but you can't look past the Miami. They're they're still an NCHC school. They're still a team that can that can win games. But boy, did they struggle last year seven twenty seven and two. Um, they they do get an extra shot at North Dakota this year. They they'll pick up a second series later in the year. But really, I mean, kind of depending on what North Dakota is is running on as far as the the previous series goes, we could see the series go either way. And and I think a lot of what goes into this series will lead into their next series. Um, but Miami could shock the world and could steal a win. So. I, I hope that North Dakota doesn't overlook them just for their own sake. But I, I don't think they necessarily will just based off of past years. Uh, I think this is a sweep for North Dakota, but then they move into Bemidji State, who's coming off of a two-week rest after playing Northern Michigan, who was a top team in the CCHA for a home-and-home series. And I think I could see this being a split home and home because both crowds are super rowdy because there's nothing around them, uh, just in general. 
the maybe north central part of Minnesota, not really a lot around them. Same with Grand Forks. And Bemidji, they didn't have a good year last year other than getting to the finals of the CCHA, but they're still a sneaky good team. Yeah, and uh, I mean, they did split last year. I could definitely see it being a split again this year. But I think it's a nice kind of middle ground game between uh, Miami and kind of the, the – stretch they're going to the two weekend away stretch that they're going to go on here uh to, to hit Bemidji State before playing St. Cloud they, they go to St. Cloud to play the Huskies um which might have been the site of their most embarrassing loss last year an eight to one game where St. Cloud put up a, a bunch of goals quickly I think this game is going to be similar to the Denver games in that it's going to really come down to the, the player of or the the play of the goaltenders both teams are going to have new goaltenders North Dakota actually both teams going the transfer route and potentially their starter um the rider from Mich- Michigan State to North Dakota and Dominic Bassey from St. Cloud or no from Colorado College to St. Cloud um he, he's coming from a team that did struggle quite a bit last year in Colorado College so a little bit more on his shoulders to play well with St. Cloud. Um, and on the other side, you know, DeRider's coming from a team at Michigan State that struggled with the last place team in, in their conference in the Big Ten. So both are kind of stepping into positions where they have to play better. But I lean North Dakota because I think North Dakota has a better blue line than St. Cloud does. Um But the offensive side, the forwards are going to be super heavy. And I think I might actually lean a little bit towards St. Cloud forward wise, especially with Micah Miller coming back, and because and, even when you were on the 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 power play, like that dude was scoring goals shorthanded last year, like like they were even strength goals, so it's it's going to be a good one. Yeah, Micah Miller's a stud. Um, he he's just so good for St. Cloud. I, I think the difference is it, it will come down to goaltending, but the difference is playing in the conference and knowing the teams versus not uh, North Dakota, they're not going into as hostile as of an environment as they will next week. I could see a split, but I I still might lean St. Cloud a little bit more just based off of their offensive firepower. But speaking of student section, the next week they go into – Arguably the best student section North Dakota will fight. Oh, it's definitely going to be. It's this. definitely going to be the best student section that North Dakota is going to see all year, but because it's mm-hmm. one of, I'm going to say it's the best student section in the entire country, but it is by far the most difficult student section that North Dakota will have to play in front of next season when they come to Kalamazoo for against the Western Michigan Broncos, without a doubt. Oh yeah, without a doubt, it's going to be the best that they see all year. Um, it's just. Th- Top three in the country. You know, you, you the top three, they can fight it out. I would argue probably top three between North Dakota and Western. You know, you two can set up a ring, fight. Hey, just let me sell tickets. I don't want to make a profit off of this. Uh, but I think I, think I would ahead. argue more that North Dakota might have the best community section. And I would definitely lean more community section for North Dakota than I would Western Michigan, even though our community has kind of gotten better over the years. But you're not going to beat Western Michigan student section. Now, granted, I would say that they're, the student section I was a part of was a little bit better. We were a little bit more attentive into games and a little bit more creative as far as gameplay when the game was going on and what we came up with. But one, it's probably the biggest student sections in college hockey the just the sheer amount of space that they take up in the ice arena is ridiculous two it's right on top of the ice we're not pushed back any we're not like in an upper bowl we're not they're right on the glass and it's basically face off dot to face off dot around the penalty boxes (laughs) whoever is in the penalty box on a penalty is not having a good time i can guarantee you that um and the power play was an issue last year for North Dakota, Western was able to score 
three power play goals in the first game uh, for, to earn a 4-1 win. And they were able to win the second game 2-0, and I think they had a shorthanded goal in the second game. So, I mean, pow- the special teams for Western were really good last year. Yes, we're losing a lot of players. Um, for those who listened to the first part of this, this is about where we were when we realized Michael didn't have sound, so you've heard me say this before. There's a, there's a big question mark as far as goaltender goes. Uh, we we're losing a lot of offensive power. We lost the leading goal scorer in the entire country in Ethan Frank. We lost a our top assist producer in Drew Warad, who went to the Grand Rapids Griffins. We do have um, their line mate coming back in Cole Gallant. So we do have a returning fifth-year senior. Uh, we lost some players on the defensive side in Michael Joyal and Ronnie Adderd. Ronnie Adderd going to the the Philadelphia Flyers to the NHL. But we do have guys like Cedric Fiedler, uh, Aiden Fulp taking on these more expansive roles, guys like Luke Granger and Max Sasson stepping up on the offensive side. And we have a couple of highly skilled freshmen coming in who are, are going to have to step into some roles that they may not have expected the opportunity to step into. But much like kind of max did last year like there's there's an opportunity to play yourself into playing time and to turn up and this is one of those series that's going to speak volumes about how your college career is going to go absolutely um Um, oh go ahead no i i I was just i was just gonna say uh then north dakota they they take a little bit of a little bit of a break and then they start getting back into things but Probably the most favorable schedule of any NCHC team coming out of the break. Uh, you say that. However, on December 31st, they will play the U.S. Under-18 development team again. They lost this exhibition game last year. Well, and that's that's one thing my, Four... my brother and I, we, we've talked about this constantly. There is no good outcome for for the the college team that's playing uh the the developmental team i mean there's a good outcome you win the game they're four and one against the development team but but is it is it a good outcome yes you, because you, you were supposed to win that game now granted you you, you, you can... are but you're beating a bunch of kids that are under 18 yeah that's that means you should thing. win that game you should. That's but... that's the good outcome, though. Winning that winning a game you should win is the good outcome. Now, do you maybe take a little bit off and go? Well, you should have won that game because you were beating on children. Maybe, maybe, yes. but yes. but I would say that winning the game has a way bigger upside than losing the game, which they did last year. They were shut out last year, two zero. Well, and that that's the thing. Right? And like, granted, you know, some of these guys might come in next year or not next year because they're the under eighteen team, but some of these guys could be yeah. future future fighting hawks down the road. And so they'll get to experience the Ralph and, and maybe uh you know, meet with some of the coaches and it's kind of really an opportunity for them to get seen a little bit. It's the the thing is, okay, say you play them and you win Four nothing, six nothing, whatever. Well, yeah, you should have beat them by that much. That that was expected. So that's not really a, a win in my book. It's like, well, yeah, it was expected. That doesn't make any sense why you're even playing them. You lose to them. Why in the hell are you losing to a bunch of under eighteen kids? I don't know, but that, they, they did it. They did it last year. And, well, and that's that's why I'm saying it's a lose lose situation for the team that plays them, and we we I mean, complain it's... about it when when UMBs play them. It doesn't make sense. It uh, it makes sense for the under eighteen team, so they can get the exposure and they can play against higher competition. And like, hey, this is what you're playing against at the next level. But for a college team, especially the caliber of a UMD and a North Dakota. Why in the world would you ever schedule them? I, I literally think you're scheduling them so that you can see them play up close and personal. Like, yes, you can you can get a lot from you can take whatever you want from video, but you're actually getting the chance to 
see them up close and personal and maybe you have a conversation after the game with a couple parents or coaches or or the coach and you get a better idea of who these kids are and, and what they could do at the college ranks. It's it's an I, opportunity I, to see it literally firsthand eyes on better than you're ever going to see from film. I could see that, but the way things are are nowadays with kids playing summer hockey and it, it goes with any sport, you have to trust your scouts. College teams have scouts. They, you have assistant coaches that are going and watching these kids play summer hockey. You kind of know, and especially in the summer with the summer hockey that they're playing, you can go watch them and see them playing against the top of the top. Yeah, it's not the next level that you're coaching. But at the same time, you can recruit them and then do a summer camp or a training camp or see how they do in juniors because that's a lot of the things. It's very rare for a kid to go straight from high school to Division One hockey. Oh, yeah. I mean, most of the freshmen that are on these teams are already 21, 22 years old. It is a mismatch in every sense of the direct and, and, and any sense of the way. But I think it's also an mm-hmm. opportunity for you as a the team who's hosting them to go, okay, I literally cannot take anything lightly. I can't take, you know, if, if I'm going to take this team lightly, I might end up taking Miami lightly and I could get bo- beat by both teams. So, I mean, like there's, there's some teachable mm-hmm. moments. Like, I mean, granted, you know, guys don't have to go out there and try and kill somebody, but you should play smart. Sound oh, they still this, should. this should be an opportunity for you to play smart, sound hockey and maybe not to rely on your physical game and actually build that finesse game a little bit. But you you still can't take this team lightly. Yes, it's an exhibition game, but it's still I think anytime you step onto the playing surface, like it plays it, it there's a mental toll that it takes losing to a team or, or beating a team like this. So does it matter in in the, in the record book? No. But I mean, I'm going to sit here and tell you that they lost to the team last year 2-0. It doesn't it doesn't really count towards the how well they finished the year out. But for the the kids on the USA team, like that's probably a big moment that they're going to hold on to, even though it doesn't really count at the end of the day. Well, and it's good for them. It, it's just a, a matter of, I think for team morale in a, in a sense where if I'm playing and I'm playing a, a U18 team, and we beat them, it's like, well, no shit. Like, we should have beat them. It, it wasn't. And I get what you're saying about not overlooking anybody and and playing hard and, and learning from the experience. But it's like, well, no shit. We should have beat them. It, it wasn't that hard. But then if you lose to them, it's even worse for team morale. So it, it's uh-huh. not quite the... I really don't see it being any worse than the Manitoba exhibition game to start the year. It's a nice way to knock the, the rink rust off um, after a couple weeks of not playing because of the holidays. And it's a, it's kind of maybe there's more pressure on this game just because they are younger kids, but it's it's still just another game to get your legs back and, and have some opportunity to play a different color jersey than, than what you've been practicing against before you get back into Games that count. Because, I mean, they start the second half of the year with a non-conference opponent. Uh, they're, this is their first year in div- playing at least a majority of a Division One schedule, if not a Division One schedule, uh, in Linenwood University. Um, I'm kind of actually excited to see this team play and see how well they do. Um, I'm going to have to... I'm going to lean towards North Dakota just because they have the experience factor. Plus they're coming from the NCHC and we have not seen a very good record of transfer teams coming up to division one hockey. Um, but at least like just for, from a first appearance, like I might watch these games after the fact, just to kind of get eyes on Lindenwood and see, see what they look like. See, um, what we can really take away from North Dakota in this situation. Uh, it could be a game kind of like we saw last year between um, St. Cloud and St. Thomas, 
where there was kind of a, a, a time and point in that game where you're using it more as training than uh, an actual game. Uh, after the first period. Yeah, I think it's... It... But it's another one of those situations where you, you can't really overlook a team because they could totally come out and, and steal one. I It is one of those situations, but I just do not see it happening. Um, I think Lindenwood, they're going to realize very quickly that being one of the top programs in club hockey is not the same as being a top program in actual Division One hockey. Hey, I mean, you can ask Arizona State about that. I think Arizona State was, like, almost undefeated for three years, and I think that they've kind of struggled to break 500 since making the, the full-time leap up. So it's, it's... Well, and, and Penn State's the same way. It, but in St. Well, St. Thomas, they were top-tier Division Three program, and they come up to Division One, But it's what happened in the past is not going to break the kid's spirit. I just think that they're going to learn really fast early on. And then I don't know what their schedule is uh, to start the year, but I think they're going to really learn once they play North Dakota. I don't think, I don't think it's going to be like what we saw with St. Thomas and St. Cloud last year to start the year. But I don't think it's going to be close. I no. think it's going to be about a five or six goal difference. Yeah, I, like I said, I'm gonna I might check out the condensed versions of these games just to kind of get eyes on Lindenwood, just to be a little bit more prepared of of what they've done uh, in case that there's game. Like I'm pretty sure they'll play some other NCHC teams next year, uh, and I just want to have a look at them. Oh God, um, Lindenwood! I just looked at their uh, first two series. Um, they play Minnesota and then Michigan. <laughs> they they are uh, jumping in head first, and then they do play Denver in December, and then North Dakota. So they're, they're yeah trying. these poor kids. These poor kids. They they have decided baptism by fire is going to be the way that they're going <laughs> to build a team. And even though Michigan lost a lot of kids. Dear God. <laughs> hey, you don't you don't make a knife by uh playing it in the ice. You gotta you gotta get that fire going, so who knows? That's gonna be an interesting that's a hell of a schedule, I'll tell you that. Jesus. Um mm-hmm. But hey, you know, kudos to them too, at the same time. Like just stepping right in there, right into the batter's box, facing that high heat. That, that high, high stinky, stinky cheese, batter. yeah. That Limburger. Uh North Dakota gets a, a little bit of a, a a home game streak here. They have three series plus the exhibition game all on home ice. Um, it's it's another matchup with Western Michigan. Western Michigan gets to travel to what I think will be their toughest student section that they'll see all year. Um, not necessarily their toughest opponent, but toughest student section slash community section because, like I said, I think North Dakota travels as a whole is people from around the school. It's not necessarily just the students that are there uh, that create the atmosphere at the Ralph. Um, Western has shocked the world and and swept North Dakota before. Um, Actually, the goaltender that we've had on the the show twice, friend of the show, probably one of of my favorite Broncos on, on the short list of Broncos that if they made the pro ranks or the NHL ranks, I would pick up their jersey no matter what team it's for. Uh, Trevor earned a sweep against North Dakota in North Dakota. Um, that was after he crapped his crapped his breezers his freshman year. Yeah. Um, actually, we we talked about the the big save that kind of helped spark. I think spark that that sweep or at least that first game win uh, when he was on the show the first time. So you know, go check out those interviews on the YouTube's. Um, great conversations with Trevor Gorsuch. Loved them. Uh, also check out our conversations with some of the other guys, uh, Ethan Frank, current assistant coach, JJ crew, um, 
our very first interview slash conversation was with uh, Ethan's dad. I think that's actually a really good episode. I still stand by that episode. Um, that was lovely. I loved his perspective awesome. on the game. So check those out if you're so inclined at the Goal Horns and Fight Songs YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, and again, you know, the biggest question for Western is just going to be that goaltender situation. And we mentioned that before when we talked about the first meeting that's here in Kalamazoo. So I, who knows? It could be even a different goaltender that plays for Western in this series. But Western does have some – they have one game of experience against the North Dakota goaltender. In fact, I think yeah. I think some of the younger guys actually were the ones who were able to score goals. So we do at least have goal scorers coming back that have scored on their goaltender. And speaking of gold, I mean, that their next series, it's the only meeting of the year, but it's, which I find kind of blasphemous, but uh, UMD in North Dakota in Grand Forks, and we still don't know who our, our goalie is going to be. I, I think it's going to be Stay Skull and a kid that's played in NCHC games and played against North Dakota in the five overtime game. I don't remember... I think he actually started that game in the NCAA tournament and then Fanti finished it off. I can't remember how that goes, but he has played against the North Dakota team. He has played in big moments. Five overtime game, you're going to cramp up. That, yeah. That's just the way that it is, and that's what happened with however it went. Um, but it's unfortunate that it comes – at this time of year and in North Dakota. But right about now is when UMD, we start picking it up. I was going to say, that might be the benefit. Like You getting down North Dakota kind of later in the year plays to what has been Minnesota's strong point. And we kind of got a little bit of that from Trevor too, I think in our, in our, I don't remember if it was the first conversation or the second conversation we had with him, but where he, he was talking about the training that Western would do and how they just kind of, would run out of gas at the end of the year as other teams were building up and probably one of the best teams to build to that last, uh, the end of the season push is Minnesota Duluth. So like that kind of plays to the, to their strength, but um, North Dakota is still like, they're a solidly coached team. They went three and one against the Bulldogs last year. These two teams, they just, these two teams beat each other up year in and year out, whether it's one series or two series. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's it's a series that we're gonna kind of see. It could have strong implications as to home ice, um, because I, I expect both of these teams to kind of be near the top of the NCHC once again. Oh, we we beat the hell out of each other. You you talk about you know WWE and the announcers saying they're just beating the hell out of each other. That's what this is. I think. Uh, in 2019, the series that was in Duluth, there was four or five ejections just based off of hits and what guys were doing to each other. So this is a big rivalry. Uh, I, I don't like that we only play them once and it's in Grand Forks, but that's just kind of how the schedule works. Uh, I think... Um, At the worst for North Dakota, it's a split. That and that's the best situation for us. I I don't see it being a sweep for UMD at all. I I think a split is the best possible thing for us. Until I see him suit up for North Dakota, I will still say that. Uh, one, it depends on how much of the emotional high where the emotions come into effect for Minnesota Duluth this year. I think they're going to want to play every game for Stace Call if he's your starting goalie. Um, the incredible comeback that he has had to this point, even I mean playing the, the one game he played or the little bit of the one game he played last year and then re-earning or having a chance to earn the starting job um, should hopefully be one of those things that rallies a team together and they come out with just a stupid ridiculously good year um yeah and i i hope so too and i just if if nothing else i hope just for him uh, as a person that 
he can rally from what he's went through with the disability cancer and, and come back, play at a high level, and then get a contract. That's that's all we can hope for. But if the team rallies around him, has a ridiculously good year, and wins a national championship, well, you know what? I'm not going to be mad about that. <laughs> I don't know that we're going to say like all the way to the national title. I'm just saying, like, I hope they have a decent year. Beat yeah, you North, guys are going to be out in the first beat round. Beat North Dakota. Um, and, and then and all's fine. Um, but I don't know necessarily about the rest of the team. I think you guys, you guys had some really strong freshmen last year. I think it, I, was it, the, I think it was the injury bug that kind of got you guys last year. Wasn't it? Oh, oh, a little bit. Yeah. The injury bug. Uh, we do have some really good young players coming back, especially White Heiser and Dominic James. Uh, who played on the juniors team on the reboot of the juniors tournament. Wyatt Kaiser, defenseman, had we talked about him last week. He had three goals, two of them were in one game. Dominic James, he's going to be a sophomore. There's a lot of young goal scorers that are on this team and a lot of young talent coming in. So we're going to be a young team, but we're going to be a dangerous team. And we still have that leadership that has come back. So I, I, I think, like I said, I think it's going to be at worst for North Dakota. It's going to be a split at best a sweep. At best a sweep for you, or uh, a split for UMD. Worst a sweep for North Dakota. Uh, that That's the way I see that too. It's because it's still not quite at the time it's getting there but usually it's not until February where things start to roll for us yeah uh they they fall right they could fall into the same damn trap at the start of the second half of the year as they fall into the first flood they have just strategically placed these trap cards uh that are the Miami Red Hawks in their schedule uh this time they're traveling to Oxford we talked about it before, more so in the take one of this episode than the take two. But, man, don't fall into the trap that is overlooking Miami. Because the first week you're coming, you have Denver preceding them. This time you have Minnesota Duluth preceding them with Denver on the other side. Do not look ahead to Denver in Denver because Miami could beat you. They, they may not win many games this season, but they could damn sure win one of these. And it would be fantastic if they did, because I would just find it humorous. Um, based, on, I think everyone would. Based on my uh, Yu-Gi-Oh references of Miami being the trap card here. Oh, um, I absolutely. I was like, okay, Yami Yugi. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting, <laughs> interesting setup to the <laughs> schedule here, and. There's really not much to say. Miami's going to struggle. Miami does Miami things, but don't overlook them because it, it could come back and bite you in the ass. And then traveling to Denver. Like, I mean, granted, there is a stretch. Like, there are some of these stretches, man. The way they have scheduled their schedule, while it may not be the toughest opponents, there's some interesting travel ways and putting teams where you may not want them to be. Um, oh, and especially with. You're going from Miami and then to Denver where they didn't lose last year until mid-January. Yeah, February against UMD. So that's a really tough opponent coming off of maybe a not-so-tough opponent where that could be another trap card where Yugi played two trap cards and Pegasus didn't read the second one and where I, I, I don't think they're not going to get up for Denver, but I just think they're kind of screwed in that game or in that series. I should say. I definitely lead so hard Denver in the series in Denver. They're just so fucking hard to beat at in Denver. Um, yeah, I generally try. I, I, I limit my swearing on this episode or on these shows, but Jesus, man, that is. Yeah, it, it's they're so good. They're so good at home. Um, yeah, 
yes, they're going to be missing some players, but the players that are coming back are, are super freaking good. We mentioned it the first time through, but, you know, uh, they lose Brink, but they still have Carter Mazur, who honestly could have been freshman of the year last year. I don't know if he was, but he could have been, should have been, would have been um, hard to argue against the kid. He's coming hey. back. Uh, their goalie, who was outstanding last year, he's coming back. Um, Kaiser Wilhelm, or whatever his name was. Um, oh, what is his name? Uh, this is honestly a pretty tough stretch of games. Yes, you throw Miami in there. Maybe not the the toughest opponent, but the position of that that team honestly makes it difficult them being there. Uh, and well, then, it, it, and the coaching of Denver, they're it, what he's thirty three or something. We talked about this two weeks ago or something. He's not much older than you and I, and the recruits that he brings in because he's been there now for about four years. He is so damn good at bringing in players, and it's unbelievable the teams that he's putting together. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, but it doesn't. I don't know. I mean, I think that's probably going to be the toughest stretch for them is going from really to start the second half of the year from mm-hmm. going to Western Michigan going to Minnesota Duluth or hosting Western hosting Duluth going to Miami, going to Denver. They're back home for St. Cloud. They've kind of had St. Cloud's number, but again, St. Cloud can put up goals quickly. Um, It's at home. St. Cloud, you know, could, could there's really, we're at a point in the season where you can't take anyone lightly for sure. You have to play your best games. Who's going to be, the healthiest who's going to be the smartest um north dakota did have a couple players who earned some suspensions last year at the least opportune times Uh, they got bit hard by the injury bug yet still were able to capture a share of the penrose um it really hurt them more in the the conference tournament and the ncaa tournament but they don't have the olympics this year to worry about um So neither does St. Cloud. Like St. Cloud lost their head coach during the Olympic time. Mm -hmm. Um, So they could potentially be a different team. You know, it's going to, I think literally every series of every weekend is going to be a a good series. There might be some other better series played this weekend. I don't remember all of them. We'll kind of touch on that more once we get into the actual season and we get to this point in the season. Um, And then they go, they get to go right back to Colorado. Yeah, I, th- I think the St. Cloud series, that'll be pretty good. Um, I can see a potential split with that just based off of team talent. But then they do get a little bit of a reprieve at the end of the year. Uh, Colorado College for the only series of the year. And we'll see what CC does. We, we have no idea what they're going to do. At this point of the year, uh, they do have some transfers coming in. I think again, a new arena on campus. It may not be uh, as clear of a straight Matt Vernon goal as I thought it was going to be. They have um, the U.S. World Juniors goalie, I believe, coming in to Colorado College, and he played pretty well in the preliminary rounds for Team USA. Oh, really? I believe so. I believe that's where he went. Um, I, th- I think he was... Um, I think ah, he, he, yeah. he's a wild... Caden. He's a Minnesota wild draft pick, I think. Yeah, Caden is uh, going to be going to Colorado College, so that could be a big step for them as far as goaltender goes. Um, now, whether he's the outright starter or he's going to split time with Matt Vernon, that's you know for them to decide, and I'm pretty sure they're, they're getting ready to, to start the process of making those decisions here soon with uh, team practices starting probably in the next couple weeks, if they haven't already. Um, but, I mean, he, he, that could be a kid who maybe helps Colorado take a step up and, and be one of those four, five, six range teams um, instead of constantly fighting for seven and eight. 
Yeah, the only thing that I would I don't know that he'll be there, like he'll be able to do that this year, but it could be a really positive step for them in the future. Yeah, especially if they split time because if you lose to the Czechs as as an American goalie. I don't know if he was the starting goalie that game. I have no idea. Well, uh, you know, if he was, then that's a little bit of a concern. Uh, but it seems par for the course for Colorado College at this point. Uh, if he wasn't, you know, good thing. But I'd, it's still, it's a little bit of a reprieve, especially at the end of the year that you shouldn't overlook him, but they they might. So Colorado College could win a game, but they, they should be able to sweep that series. And the thing that benefits yeah. Colorado College here is it's at Colorado College. For, mm-hmm. I mean, granted now, Colorado College is not the same team that Denver is, um, but they do have the advantage of one being at elevation. I think they're actually slightly higher than Denver, but um, they just play a different style of hockey. Like Denver uses everything about being at elevation to their advantage. They One, they bring you there when they have the home they're the home team clearly that's how that works but they're a physical team they will grind you down and and hold you down and make it harder for you to breathe than just being at elevation whereas Colorado mm-hmm. College doesn't necessarily play that same strong big physical style of play but they they have the opportunity to be one of those kind of teams too and just make it harder to play them even if Colorado is the away team we haven't seen I, them make that take that step yet, but that's kind of what they need to do if they want to be a top program. But you know, you you want to build a team from goalie out, and I think they're making those correct steps uh, with the incoming goalie that they're going to be picking up this year. And I really, I really want Colorado College to be that team that they were back in the WCHA, especially in the like the JT Brown era of UMD hockey where yeah we hate CC they they are our rival and they're just not quite there and you hit spot on with how Denver plays it's that NCHC style of we're gonna wear you down we're gonna grind against the boards or we're gonna cycle the puck and if CC can do that, especially at elevation, well, shoot, I probably can get up and down the ice about 10 times, and that's pushing it before I was winded. Yeah. So I couldn't imagine being pounded against the boards, you know, little cross checks in the back, trying to grind for the puck for 45 seconds, and then you look up at the clock and only five minutes has gone by. Uh, I, I think they should be able to get back to that, but the defensive style hockey, especially up in that elevation, bodes well for for teams versus the rest of the country. Yeah, Denver's more of that drag you to. If if we're talking like other sports and we're talking like say boxing or, or MMA, Denver's going to drag you to the deep rounds. They're going to pull you into deep water and they're going to watch you struggle. They're going to they're going Whereas Colorado College, they kind of tend to do a little more rope a dope. Like we'll let you beat us up, and hopefully you'll you'll run out of steam, but not too too many. They they kind of they kind of shoot themselves in the foot where they get plastered and, and beat down a little bit, and they just don't have the same it left yeah. in the tank there in the later. Like they don't want to go to deep water, uh, or they they Den- can't make it to deep water. Whereas Denver lives in, in deep water. Denver's gonna be that. Uh... Uh, Usman in the the last UFC pay per view when uh, your opponent is they realize they lost the fight and then they're just gonna rub their bloody nose and give you Eskimo kisses at yeah. the end of the with fifteen seconds. <laughs> um, but and they wrap up the season at home um, against their de facto rival, as the NCHC has done a consistent job of scheduling rival games or rival series for the last week of the year. Um, Honestly, I don't know how I feel about it 
depending on the situation, like some, sometimes I don't know if it's the best situation to, yes, it's, it's most of these schools are going to be doing their senior nights. Uh, you know, half the schools have to do their senior nights in front of a rival opponent. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's the way they want it. It's, it's, I guess it's nice that you have an important series going into the playoffs, whether it, you're a one versus eight seed, which this could potentially be, or, you know, like a Denver Colorado series like that. A lot of times that's a one versus eight or a one versus seven. There's still something more to play for uh, as far as like pride goes in the series. So I guess that's a benefit of playing a rival. Um, but for these two teams, like you have to try and build that you're hoping that at some point it's going to click and be like, okay, well we have to play these guys every year at the end of the season. How many times has Omaha seen um, North Dakota handed the Penrose while they're on the ice with them? Uh, you know, you, you want to potentially be in a situation where you play spoiler to that. Maybe, maybe that's the extra benefit of playing this team. Uh, if you're North Dakota, you know, oh, playing Omaha at the end of the year, maybe we see another Penrose. Like that's our be- our motivation to playing. Like we see them so often that we just associate playing them at the end of the year with us being handed the Penrose Trophy. Um, but for these two teams, like I, I feel like the series is difficult. It's just one that you have to grind out, and it's the end of the season, so you're there. But hopefully, it can grow and become more of that like what we expect from a rivalry series. I think it's tough for these two teams to become rivals, though. Like you said, seeing North Dakota raise the Penrose and them having to witness it, that can be a motivating factor in in Omaha trying to stop them. I, It's tough in this league, though, to have those rivalries with only eight teams and then you have the natural rivals in Colorado College and Denver. So that's two. You guys in Miami, that goes back away. That takes another two away. Then you have it St. Cloud in Minnesota, which yeah. is an in state rivalry, one that you could it, potentially do home and home. Um it's in state, but at at the same time, I think we would both go to blows to play North Dakota because we have that rivalry from the WCHA that we want to play North Dakota, but then that leaves someone out of the loop, and I think the NCHC wants that in state rivalry where you know I can drive two hours to Duluth. I can drive an hour to St. Cloud, hour and a half to St. Cloud. I'm kind of equidistant to go cheer on my team. And I think that's, that's their main motivation behind it. So I do hope that they get that animosity between them. I just don't see it happening. And especially with Omaha being the team that we think they're going to be, year in year out where we don't know exactly what we're going to get game by game. If, if they prove themselves to be a top three team, two or three team, and they can actually play in this league and be a consistent competitor. Okay. Yeah. Then I get the rivalry, but a one seed versus a six seed or a two seed versus a six seed because that's what Omaha is. I just don't see it. Yeah. I mean, it's going to, I think it's still going to take some time. Granted we're entering kind of, I think the, the 10th season of the NCHC this year. Um, so I mean they've had plenty of opportunities. And the thing that the thing that's kind of hard about building rivalries in college sports is the the amount of turnover every single year. And now with the transfer portal, like that's kind of opened it up more, and we're seeing more turnover. Um, we don't really get 
so much. And I, and I think really kind of rivalry is more for the fans than it is for the actual players, especially in today's world. Like, you know, we're getting guys from that have played juniors together or they're going to go play pros together. Um, and, and the fans, the community fans stay longer than the students on the ice and off the ice. So the rivalry is kind of more for them than it is for, or maybe the administration, it's more for them than it is for the actual players and things. But at some point, like those traditions are built and it's just a matter of how well you can pass them on and, and, and continue to build them. That, that really kind of helps build the rivalry on the ice. And it goes, it college football is probably the, the best, example we have the liberty bell with penn state do i have anything against penn state no i don't why do we even have a trophy <laughs> it, it and in nebraska we made a trophy within the last 10 years to have a trophy with nebraska it makes no sense i don't care trophies but mean money right. trophies mean money it's it's a fan thing, and it's also a geographic thing. So I – do I think St. Cloud or UMD would be better to go against North Dakota as far as money and fans and the actual rivalry? Yes. But at the same time – one of the teams is going to get left out, and you're always going to have somebody in Omaha because they don't have any rivalries. So, geographically, yeah, we don't like Iowa, we don't like Wisconsin, we don't like North Dakota, South Dakota. Everybody's more on the western half of the state, so we actually just don't care about that state. But that's what our rivalries are built on, and. One team in the NCH is going to get left out unless we bring in a Bemidji and a Mankato. Because then at, if if they come in, you had more teams, you could have Bemidji and North Dakota and then Mankato and Omaha because they're a little bit Mankato is south of the southern part of the state, so they're a little bit more for Omaha, and you can still keep Maverick versus Maverick rivalry every year. Mm hmm. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But it, I, I just don't foresee that happening no. in, in the near future. And un unfortunately, it's going to be the natural rivals and then North Dakota. Eh, we're playing Omaha until Omaha gets good. Yeah, uh, I think that's going to do it for this one. We have two more schedules to go over that we will do in the next few weeks. Um, we have to figure out something for next week still. And then we have St. Cloud after that. Figure something out for the week after that. And then we will finish our schedule breakdowns with Western right before the season starts. So fun times, fun times. Um. If you stuck around and enjoyed what you saw on Twitch, which was a whole lot of shenanigans and an hour, which I was talking to pretty much myself, as far as you were concerned, you saw some lips moving on the other side, but there were some weird pauses and me talking. So that's cool for you guys. Uh, and you feel the urge to hit the follow button. It's greatly appreciated. If you want to see something slightly more, more coherent, um, maybe you just want to wait for this to come out to the YouTubes on the day after, which it does at Goal Horns of Fight Songs on YouTube. Uh, our Twitter handle for the page has been scrolling along the bottom this whole episode, so hit us up there. Our email address has also been scrolling along the bottom of this the whole time, so hit that up if you feel so inclined. Send us some ideas, send us some questions. Send us some bad, mean comments. I don't care, whatever. Uh, that's about it. I mean, our personal Twitter handles have been scrolling uh, or are under our pictures the whole time. So you can hit those up too, whatever. Do what you want to do. You're adult peoples or your peoples. I don't know if you're adults or not. Um, if you're children's, sometimes we swear. That's what adults do. If you're adults who don't like swear words, sometimes I swear. It's what I do. 
Me too. Um, Sorry. Other than that, I don't know if you can see it, but as my hat says, pucks on net, good things happen. Like gold horns and fight songs. There we go. So until the next episode, have a good one. Thanks for hanging out. Bye-bye.